wisdom, prudentia, justice, justicia, temperance, temperantia, courage, fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. This week we'll be talking about Socrates and his influence on Stoicism, and we'll be joined by none other than Donald Robertson. If you are not familiar with Donald Robertson, you're probably listening to the wrong podcast. Donald is doing an upcoming course on how to live like Socrates, and in the show notes there will be a link and a code where you can get a discount if you want to sign up. The course starts this coming Sunday, so get signed up right away. Before we jump into the show, I want to point out that uh, I had some audio glitches here and there, partially because we were using Skype and talking across the Atlantic Ocean from Athens to Arkansas, and so you'll hear a few glitches here and there. But also, I had my audio cut out for a second when I was reading a question from a patron, so I thought I'd read his full question before we get started. It was from Michael, who wanted to know about Socrates versus Plato versus Aristotle when it comes to influencing culture. He said, I've heard that the Christian and Islamic worlds emphasize one or the other, which had cultural ramifications. When I read the question, my audio cut out for a second, so that was the full question. So, now you'll know. Enjoy the show, and if you have any questions, email sundaystoic at gmail.com. And uh, don't forget to live like Socrates. Donald Robertson, thank you for joining the Sunday Stoic Podcast this week. Uh, You've been on once or twice before, well, once before, uh, but I really appreciate actually getting to talk to you this week. And you have a fairly complex biography, so would you be so kind as to give us a a little introduction? Yeah, Um, yeah. gosh, I'll try and do this as quick as I can. I I studied philosophy uh, initially. I did my degree in philosophy, and then I did a master's in philosophy and psychotherapy. And then I became a psychotherapist and a counselor, and I did a whole bunch of different things. And I ran a training school for therapists in the UK, and then I got involved with e-learning for psychotherapy. I did some research for the Department for the Environment, DEFRA in the UK. And I got involved with... Chris Gill and the Modern Stoicism team and uh, so for like six or seven years now we've been doing Stoic Week and Stoicon and all that stuff and I've written six books and and so I, I spend a lot of time talking to people about Stoicism but mainly the relationship between Stoicism and cognitive therapy um, or ancient philosophy and modern psychology if you like. And now you reside in Canada correct? I do, well, even more confusingly, I'm Scottish, and I, I spent most of my life living in, in England uh, and working in London, but I now did reside in Nova Scotia. I'm currently staying in Athens in Greece, and when I go back to Canada, I'm going to be living in a different province, which really? is I'll be living in Toronto and oh. Ontario. I, uh, I, did, I did my yeah. master's degree in Alberta. Uh, oh, cool. studying fossil plants. So I, my connection to philosophy is tenuous at best, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I lived there for three years. I'm from Ohio originally, but, uh, but yeah, I've moved around a little bit, but not quite as much as you. But my first botany teacher was Scottish. So, <laughs> oh, <cool. laughs> so they get around. yeah, I guess so. I guess so. So, um, what brings you to Athens? Well, I actually I've thought about coming here for a while. This is the first time I've been to Athens, and I was kind of travelling, and I thought I work online. I'm, I'm a writer, and I run online training courses, and so I thought, well, you know, I could just be anywhere and continue to work for a few months. So I thought I might as well just go and stay in Athens and carry on working. And uh, so I'm kind of, it's halfway between a vacation and kind of almost living here because I'm between a part, I don't, I'm home technically, I'm homeless at the oh. moment, I don't have an apartment anymore. So I'm kind of between uh, living in places, so I'm just, I'm staying in an apartment in Athens and I'm running my course on Socrates, uh, it sort of coincides with that, Con- just worked out very conveniently. And so, and also I was in London recently, I had to travel to London for the Stoic conference. So I took a little detour on my way back to Canada. It's a little bit a little bit of a detour, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of 
a detour to another country. And it's uh, it's great. I you know I'm having a great time here. I, I didn't realise there were tortoises. There's I've, I've bumped into a few tortoises wandering around, and there's even they have some signs that say "Don't touch the tortoises." And uh, you know there's a lot of there's a lot of ruins. And I've been sending a lot of photographs back to my little girl, uh, <laughs> who back home, who is really into Greek mythology and philosophy. So I've been showing her pictures of all these uh, ruined temples and things that I've been to recently. And I've tried to blog about it and say a few things about the relationship with Socrates and the Stoics as well. And kind of things that maybe people aren't as aware of as well. I like to try and give people the psychological perspective on classical philosophy, but also kind of like some of the more obscure little details that they might find interesting that they're maybe not as familiar with. So I went to the Lyceum recently, which everyone associates with Aristotle, but actually it has a longer history of association with the sophists. And where you find sophists, you also find Socrates. He liked to hang out there and talk to them and their students. But also at some point, Chris Ipus, the third head of the, the Stoic school, lectured at the Lyceum as well. Um, not in the actual philosophical school, presumably, but in the grounds that surrounded it. So it has a, these areas have a slightly more complex history, uh, I find, than, than people normally realize. Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of overlap in time uh, with with a lot of the folks we we talk about. Um, I actually uh, just read about Socrates in the Lyceum this weekend. Uh, uh, I live in Arkansas. It's a wooded state, so I was out. I was out in the woods, uh, sitting under a tree, reading. I have to remember the dialogue. It was when when Socrates is talking to two young sophists, um, and they're. Euthydemus. There you go. There you go. I knew you knew what it was. I'll name that Socratic dialogue in one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I I read that one actually just recently, but. Um, and then I saw your blog post, and uh, it, it, those have been very interesting to follow. I saw that there's not much to see at the at the Stoa, but maybe there's a there's a pub there or something, <laughs> and, and some it's a cafe bar. Cafe, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the, they've got a really nice Stoa. There's a thing called the Stoa of Atlas, which has nothing to do with philosophy, but it's really well reconstructed, mm-hmm. and it's like a you know, lot of um, pieces exhibited there, sculpture. But the actual store of Poikile is pretty much just a hole in the ground, like with some shops around that there's not there's not a huge amount to see there. No philosophers, but there are just cats. The cats have replaced <laughs> the philosophers. And, uh, I don't know if they get the occasional tortoise there as well. But the the Euthydemus incidentally is one of the Socratic dialogues that's most resonant with Stoicism. I saw there was there was some uh discussion of of virtue and um, not placing the good in the wrong place, and and there may be other things that you you can elucidate on there, but um, those are some of the things I recall. Well, he says, I mean, what Socrates says is a little bit ambiguous. I mean, we have these kind of secondhand reports of him, anyway, so for all we know, and and they're very, they're kind of not entirely consistent between Xenophon and Aristophanes and Plato and a few other sources. Um, so we get a kind of slightly scrambled version of, of Socrates. But there's this ambiguity as to whether he says, like Aristotle and the Platonists, that there are multiple goods and virtue is the most important one, but there, there may be some uh, value to other goods, or whether he takes this hard line like the Cynics and the Stoics that says virtue is literally the only good. And in the Euthydemus, he appears to say in that dialogue that virtue is the only good. And he, he, virtue and wisdom are kind of blended together. Virtue is a form of wisdom. Um, Wisdom is one of the virtues, but the other virtues are wisdom being applied to different areas of life. And he says that all of the different good things uh, in life are forms of good fortune that befall you. There are advantages or good opportunities in life. Um, But he says really good fortune is synonymous with wisdom because the only person that can turn all of these advantages like wealth and health to his benefit is the wise man. And the fool just, like you know that meme that says drink coffee and do stupid things more quickly? (laughs) Like The uh, the Euthydemus always makes me think of that because he argues that uh, wealth in the hands of a fool just allows him to do more foolish things. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah a lot of us are checked by uh, 
by our lack of power and wealth, right? <laughs> this is a classic argument, actually, in ancient philosophies, is the idea that our lack of wealth and power and, and so on, in some ways, prevents us from just doing more stupid things more quickly. You know, we, it's the wise man can use these things well, but the foolish man uses them badly. So the, what we think of as external goods, they think of are more like, I think a better word would be opportunities. So there are opportunities we could use either well or badly. Yeah, yeah, I could see, you know, just like a screwdriver. You can use it to uh, build a cabinet or you could stab yourself in the leg. You know, you <laughs> it has multiple potentials there. <laughs> the one I like is water is kind of neutral in itself. You could use it to boil an egg or you could use it to create hydroelectric power. Or you could use it to boil your granny alive. <laughs> like, yeah, and it's neither good nor bad. It could be used for dreams of... Yeah, I'd say that one would start to edge into the bad territory, I'd say. Yeah. Now, I, like I said, I was a biology major uh, in in college and in grad school in Alberta, Canada. And um, my exposure to Socrates, you know, you, I think we read a little bit of Socrates here and there. I took an environmental ethics course where we focused more on more modern philosophers, but I think maybe we touched on just some basics there in that course, but I haven't had any direct um, exposure, uh, not a lot of direct exposure in higher education, but uh, but everyone's heard of Socrates. Heck, when I was 12, I think I saw him on Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, could you give us in the wind or something that's like that. right that's right that's right could you give us some idea why uh what it is about socrates or or or, or how, that makes him so important or or how influential he's actually been can that be overstated how in, influential he's been in western philosophy i don't it's hard to i mean socrates is kind of where i lose my mind in a way when i'm, <laughs> I'm talking about philosophers because you know, I find it quite easy to talk about Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, and then you go into to Socrates, and I approach them very much from a, a stoic perspective. And I have to kind of add this caveat to everything that I say by beginning. He, he's not like other. He's not like other people. He's not like other philosophers. And actually, this this in itself is is part of his character that. Um, Plato in particular describes Socrates as being a topos, like um, odd, kind of out of place, you know, like he he describes him in these really bizarre ways. At one point he compares him to a, a, um, a torpedo fish that stings people and paralyzes them. And at another point he compares him to Selenus, this kind of comic figure that's the teacher of Dionysus, the god. He's, sort of drunken tutor to Dionysus. They, they don't really know how to conceptualize uh, Socrates, and he's this inherently ambiguous, multifaceted, complex figure. As a, a person, he's much more fascinating, I think, than almost any other philosopher. And it's impossible to separate his philosophy from his character. We... Someone asked me, you know, how would I describe the relationship between Stoicism and Socrates? And this is a massive oversimplification. <laughs> but I kind of wanted to say that Stoicism in some ways is kind of like Socrates in bullet point form. Uh, the, the, so the Stoics were described as dogmatic philosophers, which means not that they were rigidly dogmatic or doctrinaire, but that they had a set of principles that they could clearly define and follow. Right. Whereas Socrates, you... you you, many of these ideas are implicit. He does have what's sometimes called his positive philosophy, which seems to have influenced the Stoics. But what we mainly have are, are dialogues in Xenophon and Plato um, and a few other fragments where he's asking questions. And he does it in a very kind of arch, sort of roundabout, kind of ironic you know, uh, manner. Um, and there's all these ambiguous and layers upon layer of meaning to what he's doing. So, yeah, I lose my mind when I try to describe Socrates because he's such a complex figure. And people have this love-hate relationship with him, I find. I mean, I think most people appreciate him now, you know. But even some people who read him now, I, I, I warn people at the beginning of my course, like some people will just find him frustrating. <laughs> um, I can see that. Kind yeah. of annoying, you know. You do get people who, who read the dialogues now and go, I don't believe 
blame the Athenians for uh, making it what? Yeah, I, I've heard that many times. <laughs> um, but you know what I'd say? Even those people, I think, sometimes can be converted. You know, like if you if you persevere with him, he's. You think you have to get through this initial barrier of, of why is this guy asking me these stupid questions? And the, even the Athenians are they, they say, geez, look, time and time again, we're told he starts off by asking what seem like like stupid questions in a way. You know, the, even uh, to his students in this office, they like, they get slightly annoyed and say, why are you even asking me this? You know, it seems like a, bit of a dumb question. And then he go, he persevere with it, and it start to some really clever things start to happen. He switches things around on people and he gets to deeper layers of meaning and then he leaves you in confusion and apparia. Why like you you're like stung by this manta ray or whatever and you left in bewilderment and I, at that point either you just run away waving your arms in there thinking get this guy away from me or you I think Euthyphro, think, Euthyphro <laughs> kind of does that doesn't he? He's like oh look, look at the time I gotta go see you later Socrates Is that, yeah look at the time <laughs> yeah anyway I, I need to get out here and I should you know the other level to this is that there's so much there's so many layers of meaning to it I mean one is that this office obviously charged money for teaching. But in order to do that, I think the implication is that they tended to have doctrines that were kind of their trademark teaching. And so you would go to this office and they would teach you what justice is and they would have kind of a formula for teaching it. And then they'd have an elaborate speech where they talk about that, but basically they're teaching these doctrines. Um, like you trademarked a little idea or a definition. And Socrates, by blowing that apart, would kind of destroy their product you know he's like, like the, he's uh, like the uber of philosophy then right yeah <laughs> that's a good analogy he's like, he, he really he disrupted the marketplace for philosophy completely because prior to that you could just kind of teach people stuff and then he came along and started asking all these questions and then it, it like a uh, contagion like his student we're told you know everyone started going well you know what about this exception to that and there's, there's a double standard here and like and, and so that blew the minds of the sophists. Um, so they thought, well, we used to just get paid a lot of money to come along and teach stuff. All right. Now people start asking us all these difficult questions about it, and uh, it's like a free for all suddenly. <laughs> uh, so yeah, he was he disrupted the marketplace. That's very well put. Actually, I hadn't thought about it like that. Um, and you know that frustrated a lot of people. Hmm. It got trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my my reading this week on the podcast, the one that just came out, was the first part of the apology, where he uh, he talks about um, that he's a good example of of the lack of wisdom in humanity, but he's wise in that he admits he's unwise, and and then he makes everyone mad uh, at that point by showing that they're not really wise, and that's kind of where my reading left off. I haven't continued on, but uh, it's interesting how he. He's the gadfly, as he calls himself, uh, kind of going around and buzzing around and annoying everyone <laughs> with his questioning. Yeah, the gadfly is his other analogy, isn't it, in the apology. The apology is one of the finest pieces, absolutely, of, of classical literature, hands down. People ask, you know, again, it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but then they're, they're, you know, they're wrong. Like, it's, it's a masterpiece. Um, and I'm not even... Plato, you know, the biggest fan of Plato, like many Stoics, you know, have kind of mixed feelings, but I think Plato obviously misrepresents uh, Socrates by putting his own doctrine, the theory of forms in his mouth and other stuff. Um, but in the Apology, we, we, I think we have, a, a, you know, something that's really a masterpiece and has layers upon layers to it and little fragments of arguments in it as well that aren't really properly developed but kind of anticipate stuff that we find in the Stoics and Epicureans regarding the indifference towards death. And the, the Apology, strangely as well, because it's a kind of a particularly characteristically platonic um dialogue it's really a monologue there's bits of dialogue in it but the it, it's it's also one of the ones that kind of comes close to stoicism because he he heavily implies in it he doesn't straight up say but like in the euthydemus where he does more explicitly say this he implies strongly in the apology that he thinks that virtue is the only true good um it comes or it comes very close to saying that so 
and then obviously it's about his death as well. So there's a, a lot of stuff in it. In addition to the stuff about the Delphic Oracle, there's all this stuff about his indifference towards death and so on. It's it, it, and it's not even that long. Everyone should be forced to read it. Yeah, they like it or not. <laughs> it's right. referenced a lot by the Stoics. I've noticed this, like, uh, and also yeah. um, is it Crito where he's yeah. given the chance to flee and he does not? I know uh, yeah. Ep- Epictetus talks about that, about living our role and how we would all find an excuse to run out of the prison, <laughs> but he knew the proper proper thing to do. There's uh, so many different versions of that as well. That, you know, Plato kind of plays it. When, Xenophon kind of, uh, in a more, how can you put it, pragmatic moment of kind of, kind of mentions that, you know, of course Socrates at this point was pushing 70. So, you know, his version of it is like, well, you know, he was a really old man by Athenian standards anyway, to be honest. And there's a subtext to it as well, which is if he'd paid a huge fine, um, assuming he hadn't just got his patrons and friends to pay it for him, the, I think the Athenian law would be that you, you could get fined a huge amount, but then you, you, you had to serve time in prison, like a kind of debtor's jail. And I think... One of the kind of undercurrents here is that if he'd accepted a huge fine, he may have ended up in prison anyway. And in an Athenian prison, I'm guessing, you know, was pretty basic. And if you're, you're pushing 70, like, he's like, I'm probably going to die in a muddy cave with, a, you know, bars of cha- shackled by the ankle anyway. So um, that's one possible reason. Sure, sure. It is interesting to me uh, reading uh, – I, I just – finally read through the complete um, discourses of Epictetus. I, he mentions, uh, you almost think of, of, of his view of Socrates as almost like a Christian view of Christ <laughs> in some ways. He says, yeah. he says uh, Socrates, uh, something along the lines of Socrates um, released humanity from the, from the bonds of the fear of death uh, because you saw how gracefully he accepted it and Therefore, we know that it's not an evil kind of a thing. It's kind of inter- it's interesting to see that. See, the, the, again, there's this annoying ambiguity in our, our text that says that there's some hints that the, the Stoics actually conceptualize themselves as Socratics. Um, we have a, a commentator that says like these these guys are basically Socratics, and there, there's hints that Zeno, when he founded the Stoa, was maybe even trying to kind of get back to Socrates, and and partly it's the location hints at that as well. The Stoa Poikile is, is uh, in on the edge of the uh, Agora, where it's out in public where Socrates used to teach. So the Stoics were returning philosophy to the marketplace where Socrates used to be doing philosophy. Um, people maybe don't realise that. Whereas the academy and the lyceum were, were further out. Like the academy, I, I read actually at the archaeological site that the name academy is believed to have originally meant the, the faraway suburb it's outside the city walls. So these places were more secluded. But the Stoics were the ones that were doing it back where Socrates was doing it on the street. And, and so they, I think they really thought of themselves right from the get-go as, as disciples of Socrates and trying to emulate Socrates. Uh, at least there's an argument that you can make for that. And and then in Epictetus, geez, like, I mean, it really does look like that's, like that's what he thinks he's doing. He at one point straight up tells his students that they should emulate Socrates. He says that you should. They should. He says something like, "You might not be a Socrates at the moment, but you should try to aspire to become right. like Socrates." And that couldn't be clearer. Like he say, he he doesn't. Um, and he says at one point in a situation, "Ask yourself what Socrates would do, or what Zeno would do." So it seems pretty clear that they think that there's a thing that's sometimes called the cynic. Stoic succession, the idea that they're part of a philosophical lineage that begins with Socrates, Antisthenes, Diogenes the Cynic, Crates, Zeno, and then down through the Stoic school. But they they want to trace a direct line back to Socrates and see Socrates and Zeno in a way as their, their supreme role models. Um, which is interesting because the, the, the Platonic version of Socrates we have looks like it's a different slightly different ball game, but it is possible to reconstruct an image of Socrates that makes him sound a lot more like a cynic or a stoic. In the in Aristophanes, the way that he describes 
Socrates is looking and behaving makes him sound a lot more like a cynic. Um, he basically says he looks like a beggar. You know, he walks around barefoot and he looks kind of dirty and uh, he follows all of long hair and stuff. And you think, that sounds like he's describing the cynics, um, these kind of renunciates. So they, I should also say that Epictetus, I'll give you some num- some data if you like. They, Socrates is the philosopher that Epictetus mentions mo- by far the most often in the discourses. And we have half of the discourses, by the way. There were allegedly originally eight volumes, and we have four of them surviving. So we, he mentions him more often than anyone else. He mentions him about twice as often as uh, Zeno, if I remember rightly. Um, so he mentions him far more often than any of the Stoic teachers. And it's clear that Epictetus is really, that's his main role model. And then we see that also in Marcus Aurelius as well, who's largely a follower of Epictetus's kind of brand of stoicism i here's a little bit of kind of obscure trivia as well i'll, I'll drop it in because it's, it's it's just a little nugget and i think it helps people a lot what what happened to the stoic school you know it, it, it disappeared um the uh around the time of the middle story it, it, it kind of disintegrated or fragmented however you want to put it and according to one author it, it it divided into three branches so and those were corresponded to the followers of the last three scholars or heads of the Stoic school. So the last head of the Stoic school at Athens was Panatius, and then uh, his predecessors were Antipater and Diogenes of Babylon. And so we have these three sects of Stoics kind of leading into the Roman Imperial era who apparently still existed then. So there maybe, maybe there was not one but three Stoicisms by that point. And so then it raises the question, well, Epictetus, he seems very different from Seneca. And, you know, well, then it's tempting to to wonder, does Epictetus represent a different branch of Stoicism from Seneca? And then a a very hard question to answer is, well, which one of these three branches might they they fit into? Epictetus doesn't mention Panatius, but Seneca seems to be drawing on the middle Stoics more, right? So maybe there were some Stoics who liked the Lyrism, and then there were maybe other Stoics who wanted to go back to an earlier Stoic model. And I think that's what we see in Epictetus as an attempt, to some extent, to return back to the roots of Stoicism. That's why he keeps banging on about Zeno and Chris Ipus and Socrates so much. And he also loves Diogenes the Senate. Oh, yeah, yeah, he He wants to get back to an earlier, (laughs) more kind of crusty, more kind of cynic form of Stoicism. (laughs) And they call it, some Stoics we know, called cynicism a shortcut to virtue. Like um, this kind of idea that if you want, if you were, it wasn't for everybody, but for some people, if they were to live like a monk or a renunciate, you know, they lived like a beggar almost, that mm-hmm. this extreme lifestyle may be a way to, to progress as a Stoic, but they don't seem to have thought it was appropriate. Epictetus almost warns his students that not everyone is cut out for this. It's, I think it's actually, I mean, this seems kind of surprising in a way, but I think there may even be hints, there's an argument to be made that possibly Marcus Aurelius was originally into cynicism, and then, or, or originally was into, there's this kind of blurry area where are you a cynic or a stoic, right. he may have been into cynicism or this kind of hybrid of cynicism and stoicism that existed, um, and then he kind of later got into this more, how would you put it? It's kind of urbane, kind of moderate version of Stoicism that you a little bit more like Seneca and whatnot. So uh, the listeners are all quite familiar, I'm sure, with uh, the meditations, the Enchiridion, the discourses, letters from a Stoic, things like that. Now, if we're going to start to explore this character uh, of Socrates, now obviously he didn't he didn't write yeah. anything himself, or at least nothing exists that he wrote. Uh, where should we begin? He wrote some poems, allegedly, when he was in prison, like, according to Plato. He tried to put Aesop's fables into verse, but we don't have any writings by him. Where should we begin? Um, I mean, I well, see, people do tend to prefer just to go straight to the classics, and I would recommend that, actually. Um, if you're a Stoic, though, and you're interested in Socrates, it may be worth reading A.A. A. A. Long's book, which is called Epictetus, 
a Stoic and Socratic Guide to Life, if I remember rightly, is the title. And so that's a book about the relationship between Epictetus and Socrates. So that's a good inroad if you're coming from a background in Stoicism and you want to get into Socrates. But, you know, really, I, I'm, I'm one that would say, you know, go to the original texts. If, if that's your kind of cup of tea, I'd read the Apology. And, and funnily enough, I'm a big fan of Xenophon's writings. Um, you know, and I, I particularly, I think they resonate with the Stoics a little bit more. So, um, I would say, I would say read uh, Xenophon's memorabilia, uh, you know, maybe his, uh, his symposium, uh, the apology attributed to Xenophon as well. You know, those are things worth reading. In terms of the Platonic dialogues, it's, uh, I, I talk a lot about this. Like, I, the Republic is one of Plato's slightly later it's kind of middle period dialogues it's it's got stuff in it that's more plato than socrates but book one of the republic and the republic's huge it's it's 10 dialogues um if i remember it's 10 10 volumes so like it's like 10 dialogues welded together the book one definitely looks completely different from the rest hmm. right it's a whole different ball game and so a number of scholars have said well this kind of looks like he wrote it earlier and then the other nine ones he's kind of added on as a kind of appendix years later. But book one is a masterpiece. I mean, some people would say the whole thing is, but, you know, I, I'm not so keen on the later books. But the book one is, is right up there, I think, with the, the apology and the symposium. Symposium's a little bit longer, maybe, but if you're up for it, it's, it's got a little bit more drama, a little bit more excitement in it. If you're stoic, you probably read Euthydemus as well. Um, but book one of the Republic is is one of the first things that I read by Plato, and, and don't feel that you've got to then be off put off by kind of wading through the rest of it. Just read book one, and the, there are, for example, what's the most famous thing that Epictetus says in in passage five of the Enchiridion? He says it's not things that upset us, but it's our judgments about them. Well, that argument is in book one of the Republic, and uh, it's not actually put in Socrates' mouth, although I think that this is an argument that Socrates employs. It's put in his mouth also by Xenophon. But he's talking to an elderly Athenian gentleman, uh, a foreign resident uh, at the Piraeus called uh, Cephalus, and this, he says to him, "What? could you tell me what it's like being like a, an older person, how do you cope with the difficulties of old age? It's an odd kind of discussion. And, and Kefla says, well, look, I know lots of other old guys because birds of a feather flock together. We all can hang around together. And they complain constantly. He says, but, but I don't. It doesn't really bother me so much. He goes, so what that tells me is it's not the aches and pains and, and things that are the problem, but it must be your attitude towards them. Like, and so this is this same same point that he makes, and he makes it in the same way that Epictetus does. That if some, different people feel differently about the same event, that suggests maybe it's not the thing itself that upsets us, but something about our perspective, our judgment, or our attitudes towards it. And I, I think this comes really from Socrates because it crops up in a number of the dialogues, but it's there in Book One of Plato's Republic. Uh, so definitely, and it, it's presented in a beautifully subtle form as well. I won't digress into it, but he presents a, a more sophisticated version of it, which is definitely worth reading. Excellent. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I, uh, I have it on the shelf. I haven't cracked into that one just yet. Uh, so I'll, that'll be, that'll, I'll move it up in the queue to, uh, <laughs> to the front of the line. Um, I'm going to read a question from a, a patron and if you can't answer it, we'll move on, but cause I can't answer it. I know that much. He's, Michael asks, I've always wondered about Socrates versus Plato versus Aristotle when it comes to influencing culture. I don't really know so much about Islamic culture um, in terms of the extent to which they, they embrace so I don't think they were particularly, I don't think Islamic philosophers were particularly influenced by, by Socrates. Um, since uh, it was really Thomas Aquinas, as I understand it, that the really embraced Aristotle's philosophy and made him the preeminent philosopher of Christian society. Uh, and prior to that, Plato had his considerable influence over early Christian thinkers. So that's kind of my understanding of the of the influence in a, in a nutshell. Um, there's a kind of blending of 
markets are really, stoicism was around for like 500 years. I mean, markets are really, it's this huge kind of like explosion of stoicism in a way, like the Roman emperor is a stoic, like right. full on, so he's famous for stoic. And then it disappears. And like, there's virtually no reference to, to stoicism. There's like one or two mentions of names and that's in passing after the time of Marcus Aurelius. It's like, where did it go? <laughs> um, and it, it seems that stoicism was kind of assimilated into Platonism and then Platonism mutated into Neoplatonism and then it, it kind of got assimilated by Christianity, like essentially. So the, these things all kind of bleed into one another and you know, that's... That's my understanding of how uh, the pagan philosophy kind of came to an end, as it were, and was replaced by Christianity. So the the, the Stoic influence is still definitely there, um, but it's kind of mediated, arguably, by Platonism. After having read the accounts of, of Socrates, uh, what what do you draw from it? You know, we, we talk about in Stoicism, you know, as a practical philosophy, as we, there are several things we can do to be more mindful, let's say, uh, to 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 uh, not get upset by events that occur around us. You know, all, lots of exercises and things. Are, is there anything from Socrates that you can bring into your daily life that that will help you in the long run? I think some of these Stoic techniques are actually implied in Socrates. Although they're kind of usually less clearly stated, and then we have the Socratic method itself, which kind of brings us full circle in a way to, you know, where you were approaching things from initially today, as you, you've been reading the Apology recently, which is all brings in this idea about the the Oracle of Delphi, and uh, you know, Socrates is here, isn't he, the wisest man in, in Athens or in the world? And so, what we we have in Socrates is this idea of self-analysis. And questioning, and also of engaging in philosophical dialogue, that's not as explicit in the Stoics, although we they do use the Socratic method, and we can actually see Epictetus using the Socratic method in one of the, the discourses, at least one of the discourses. Um, there's a, a little Socratic exchange. So Socrates would say to us, "Look, ask yourself what is justice. Ask yourself what is the nature of the good." And, you know, the Stoics are all in with this idea as well, that you should be really interested in what the essence of the most important thing in life is. You know, what's your fundamental goal in life? You know, really, you know, clarify these these values, these deep underlying values that you have. So what is virtue? What is courage? What qualities do you admire in other people? And then try and define it in words and then question that definition other ex exceptions to it, is it too broad, is it too narrow, does it lead you into contradictions? And then it takes, Socrates warns us, it's going to take patience to do that. It's going to be uncomfortable doing it. Like, if you can persevere through that, then, you know, his, I think his fundamental message is that's, that's what philosophy is, that's what Socratic method is. And he presents it as a kind of therapy. And interesting, the apology and elsewhere is a therapy for conceit because he thinks that he, he uses this term several times that there's a form of arrogance or conceit that we all suffer from that we kind of presume that we know what's good and what's bad in life uh, he's just Socrates is kind of saying look if you ask anyone do you know what's good and what's bad in life they'll be like yeah obviously everyone knows that like you know what do you think I'm some kind of idiot like but then if you ask them what can you explain it to me they'd go blah, 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 like, and they start contradicting <laughs> themselves they go I, I don't know I don't know um, and it becomes very evident very quickly that they haven't really thought about it much and so his big revelation is you don't care you don't care about the most important things in life and that really in a way is the big revelation of Socrates that we're all arrogant and conceited and we think we we know like, no one's going to say, I don't care about justice, I don't care about, like, you know, we act as if we know what these things are, but as soon as we're pressed, we fall to pieces, and we can't answer the most basic questions about it, and that's his big insight, I think, like, we should question ourselves, and tolerate that, and talk to other people about it, and try to obtain more clarity about these things. Another thing, there are many things we can take from Socrates, but another one is, there's a really good dialogue, um, in Xenophon, the well, one that I really like about friendship, and friendship is very important to the Sto all these philosophers, um, basically, even
in you know Epicureans or Aristotelians, friendship was much more of an important subject to them than it, than it is to us today. And Socrates talks about it a lot, and he's talking to the son of Crito, his name is Critobulus, if I remember rightly. And this kid comes to him. He's a, he's probably about fifteen, sixteen. He's he's you know a young adult in Athenian terms, and he, he's kind of entering into society. And he goes to Socrates because Socrates knows everybody, and he says, "Look, Socrates, you're the guy to know, right? Like, could you introduce me to some of these?" Aristocrats that you know and important people, famous people and stuff like you know, the sophists and everybody. Like you know, I need help, kind of meeting people, and, and I thought you'd be the guy to speak to. And Socrates asks him what seems like an innocuous question. He says, "Well, what are the qualities that you would look for in an ideal friend?" And they start discussing that. And again, it seems like a banal question. But then he does this Socratic switcheroo on him, and he suddenly turns it into something quite uncomfortable and kind of, you know, a really a, a quite a penetrating line of questioning. So he says to him, "Look, Chrysopolis, you, you, these qualities that you're seeking for in an ideal friend, but like how many of them do you possess yourself?" And then he suddenly, he's, ah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> None of them. Like, I don't know. I haven't really tried to develop them. Like, and then Socrates says, "Well, I'd be the easy part is for me to introduce you to other people. That's a piece of cake, because um, I just have to go and tell them what a fantastic guy you are. But I'd be lying if you couldn't tell me that you have all these virtues that possess vanity. So this is the first thing that you need to do. Then is not try to make friends, but try to make yourself the sort of person." that would be desirable and then making contact with them follows naturally from that because people will want to introduce you. So he turns the whole thing around dramatically on the guy and we should do that to ourselves. We should use this double standard strategy and think what do we admire most about other people? You can see the Stoics doing this as well. In book one of the meditations, Marcus thinks about all of his friends and teachers and asks himself what he most admires about them and then we should turn that around and ask ourselves how much effort that we put each day into developing the same qualities that we admire in other people or that we would be looking for in the, in the ideal friend. Excellent advice. Thank you, Donald. Um, do you have anything uh, coming up that you'd like to share with the, uh, the listeners? Yeah, I've got a lot of things that are, are kind of happening at the moment, and there's a, a few things in the pipeline that I can't maybe say that much about. I'm working on a comic. Um, we'll see how, uh, you know, fingers crossed that develops uh, about Marcus Aurelius and a few other little projects like that. But the main thing is my course, How to Live Like Socrates, which I is all about Socrates' personality and how the stories about him relate to these philosophical teachings and the practical side of it. So we're focusing on this idea of Socrates as distinct from Plato's account. So the early Platonic dialogues, uh, what the Stoics say about him, what Xenophon says about him, kind of trying to reconstruct a arguably more authentic version or a particular version of uh, uh, Socrates that's kind of simpler, more down to earth, more practical. And I found that when I ran this course before, it was all people who were interested in Stoicism that did it. So that's it's, it's ended up becoming a bit kind of Stoic inflected, and also in relation to cognitive therapy. So my interest is it's odd in a way. It seems natural to me, but it's kind of odd if you look at the books on on these subjects. The what I'm interested in are the philosophical arguments that Socrates presents, but in addition to that, the psychological impact of them and how they may affect our, our quality of life from the perspective of, of cognitive therapy. Um, so we're not interested in getting deep into the intricacies of the theory of forms or something like that or the political theory of the, the ideal republic. What we're really interested in is the, what Socrates is really trying to do to improve the character. Um, and I would say, ironically, that wedding the philosophy to psychotherapy in this way is really getting back more to what Socrates was actually trying to do. He saw it as a therapy for him. It was totally about improving the character of the people that he was working with and not about constructing some complex political or metaphysical theory. It's about changing people's lives, absolutely. So we're kind of approaching it from that point of view. So that course is four weeks long. It's pretty intense. There's a lot of videos and audio and um, discussions that go on in it. And I'll be doing the webinars live from Athens, like, so that kind of adds a little twist to it. 
and uh, that starts um, on Sunday uh, coming, so it's not too far off, uh, and that's what I'm going to be spending all of my time doing over the next few weeks. So that's uh, October the 20th, I believe. 20th, it's 20th or 21st? Uh, oh, wait, you're right, 21st. 20th is Saturday. I can't read a calendar. Yeah, 21st. <laughs> yep, you're correct. Um, so how we, can uh, the listeners find out more about well, that course? Um, well, should we can share the easiest way, actually, is if we share a link. I guess, if we, can we do that? We post a, yeah, I'll put it in the show notes. Post a link. So they can just open up the notes and find the link. And there's a discount uh, that I give to people who are subscribed to my newsletter. So I'll, if people are watching the podcast, then I'll give them a, a, a special link or a coupon code or whatever so that they can get a, a discount off the, the normal course price. And then, you know, we'll we'll be kind of going into I, – I love doing this because, uh, you know, I'm, I've, I began reading Plato and Socrates when I was um, – probably about 15, 16, and it, it's kind of really remained with me throughout the rest of my life. So it's to me, it's, it's like a fantastic opportunity to kind of put everything else aside and go back to this thing that's been bugging me for decades. And, the, you know, I've always, it's always been in the back of my mind and I've, I've wanted to kind of explore a lot further. And some of my favourite Socratic things, I should say, are, are things that people won't be familiar with or are unlikely to be. One of my favourite dialogues is a pseudo-Platonic dialogue called the Axiochus, um, where which is all about death, and it, it really it takes some of the arguments that he touches on in the Apology and develops them a lot further. So we don't know how accurate that is. Is was, was it something that Socrates actually said, but it may be historically accurate, and certainly it's part of the way that Socrates' philosophy was understood uh, by ancient, ancient Greeks and Romans. So there are some of these dialogues that more clearly bridge between Socrates and uh, Hellenistic philosophy, like the Stoics. And that's the area that I'm particularly interested in, which people might be less familiar with, but that's where we get the more therapeutic, more practical stuff being brought to the forefront, I think. And uh, you have, uh, you have a second edition of your 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 book coming out, the how to book. So I've got bookwise. I've got two second editions coming out. I've got the the revised the second edition of Stoicism: and The Art of Happiness, uh, which is like a self help book, a teach yourself book, and then I have philosophy, the philosophy of CBT, Stoic philosophy as rational and cognitive psychotherapy which a, a second edition of that is going to come out in a year or so. And then in around March or April, in April, uh, I have a new book coming out called How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, uh, which is like a major thing that I've been uh, working on for about a year and a half now. And so that's coming out soon. And, uh, and then other smaller projects there. It's amazing how many things come up in relation to you're a, you're a pretty busy guy I, I get the impression yeah uh, and thank you for the putting on stoic week and uh and i've done the uh the uh, stoic mindfulness and resilience training course that was an excellent course i'd recommend to anyone out there as well some people keep asking me when it's going to run again we try to do it every year but we haven't done it this year so maybe we'll run it in november but we were i'm hoping that we'll get the opportunity to do progressively more controlled research studies and get more data. We recently did a follow-up on SMRT where people did it and we measured the benefits and then we followed up three months later and Tim LeBon analysed the data and he found something quite remarkable because normally you'd find a wearing off reduction in the benefits of CBT or other psychological skills with the passage of time. And when he did the three-month follow-up on SMLT, there was virtually no reduction uh, in the, the benefits that people experienced. So our big kind of hope for stoicism in terms of how it would fit in, in terms of modern psychology, uh, and maybe people don't ask this question enough, enough, is how would it fit in? What would we actually use it for? Because it it has some role, it has some benefits. So it would 
wouldn't be as a th- it wouldn't be as a therapy. So people sometimes assume that you can take ketones and combine it with CBT and deliver it as a therapy. I won't digress into reasons why, but I don't I don't think that's I don't think that's the best approach. Prevention is better than cure, and the holy grail of mental health would be what we call resilience training or preventative psychological skills training and there's already a body of literature on that but there's a problem with it which is that when people are taught psychological skills for prevention it works but the effects wear off over time so it looks like they have to receive booster sessions every couple of years to maintain the long-term benefits and the big hope for stoicism is that because it's a philosophy and a system of values it it might have more sticky benefits like it might be more pervasive and more lasting if people kind of buy into the philosophy. So the, our big interest is could stoicism be used as a large-scale resilience-building approach if we combine them with elements of CBT. And that's where I think the research is going, just as a little kind of appendix to our discussion. That's great. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, Donald, thank you for joining the podcast again, and we will put a link to your uh, – course in the show notes and uh, enjoy your stay in Athens. Yeah, I will do. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Right. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Cheers. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. Become a member of the Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. Carpe diem.